Weston Nakamura's favorite question, Ralph. What impact is Japan continuing to have on us? Look, when the world's largest savings nation has a currency crisis, obviously the BOJ is forcing people to essentially buy foreign yields. Also means that the purchasing power of Japanese savings pools is less. I think it just further adds to volatility in markets. Dollar yen always has a way of destabilizing things. So, you know, Weston is right to focus on it. It's a very, very important market. Okay. So, that's an extremely popular J-pop group called AKB48, or as I've taken the liberty of renaming, USD148. Haha. Uh, and no, it's not as random as a uh, reference as you may think, though... Fair enough if you thought that it was some random video meme, uh, given I am a fairly weird person. So my use of pop group AKB48 directly ties in with what I'm going to cover in this video, which is a look back at this historically tumultuous first half of 2022 through the lens of the Bank of Japan and its policy actions taken and still in effect, as well as policy actions not taken namely yield curve control, um, as well as the battle going on in markets between investors and the Bank of Japan in the JGB market, and obviously has implications on global uh, sovereign rate markets, um, and the other battle going on in the FX markets, namely the plunging in. January of this year, I had first began flagging the BOJ after the BOJ January policy meeting. Um, and I made a whole series of videos, the first of which was called Why Global uh, Markets Are Addicted to the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan cannot start to like unwind and start selling JGBs into a non-existent market that they own more than half of. Bank of Japan's yield curve control is indirect US and European yield curve control. You have Japanese cash hoarding sitting on piles of yen in need of yield. If JGB yields are pinned at zero, then Japanese investors buy overseas bonds like U.S. Treasuries and thereby cap U.S. Treasury yields. This is also how you could have a seven handle on CPI and U.S. Treasury yields at you know below 2% because the world of U.S. Treasuries does not revolve solely around U.S. inflation or even the Fed for that matter. And there are global participants that have some serious firepower and they will exercise that firepower as they see fit to their needs. And they don't give a shit about gasoline prices in the United States. So, if not for the Bank of Japan pushing yield-starved Japanese investors overseas, U.S. and global yields and credit spreads would be through the fucking roof. And thereby, the S&P 500 and the tech stocks and all that would be through the fucking floor in this current environment. It's because of the Bank of Japan and their insanely accommodative and globally impacting easing policy that's been running for the last half a decade. If yields continue to climb and it calls for BOJ to do a fixed rate operation and they offer to buy an unlimited amount of JGBs at a time when global central banks are tapering, that makes Japan the sole bond market manipulating, free market destroying policy force left. Japan's the only economy left in the, in the hospital bed that's in need of like this ICU care. It undermines the efficacy of the policy itself. The other side is that if 
BOJ abandons yield curve control, global markets will implode. CPI comes out of it a little bit in, for the United States if like yields blast through 2%, which I believe that they will because of the options positioning on our 10 year US Treasury futures. If US Treasuries are yielding above 2%, then Bank of Japan is going to have a fixed rate operation. And if Bank of Japan can't handle that fixed rate operation, things can get very ugly very, very quickly. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But either way, the bottom line is that global investors, all of you, cross asset, I don't care what it is that you trade or invest or whatever, you need to be aware because every other central bank is about to abandon a decade of this artificial you know, intervention and just back off it as if there's going to be no consequences. Well, there's a good, the, those consequences are being held at bay because of the Bank of Japan. But A, can the Bank of Japan handle that by themselves? And B, what happens if they cannot or will not and they throw in the towel? You're looking at a completely different world in markets, uh, absent the Bank of Japan's extremely radical accommodative policy that is the only policy that is still in place. Okay, so pay attention to the Bank of Japan. You didn't really have to until now. You definitely have to now. It is the most consequential because people are not paying attention and because it is actually the most consequential for the reasons I just mentioned. Now, I also have another BOJ video that came out shortly after that first one in which I talk about my theory of BOJ press tests, as I like to call them, and how to potentially read the BOJ's, you know, policy actions, um, or at least th what they're considering, via observing their leaking of these policies purposely to financial media outlets in order to test market waters. If Kuroda had actually said what that Reuters article said they were going to say, global sovereign bond yields would explode upwards. It would be m more impactful than the Fed actually hiking rates. Because that part everyone knows and is braced for is long priced in. Um, the BOJ hiking rates for the first time since 2000, that is not something that the world is accustomed to, ready for, or even considered. Now, regarding this press test theory, just because like nothing happened on the surface of like this BOJ policy meeting, um, and there's like sort of calm and quiet, it doesn't mean that there wasn't a bomb that was about to go off with the wire cut at the last second. Like just because it's quiet doesn't mean that things aren't happening. The Bank of Japan will absolutely make another major global cross-asset market moving event at some point. And BOJ is currently trying to not shock markets anymore. And so these are things that you can kind of use to keep in mind to read the climate prior to a potential major central bank triggering cross-asset market moving events. You don't have to get caught completely off guard if you can sort of read what the BOJ is doing and how they're doing it. And this like general concept, by the way, this is not really like specific to, this is like everybody does does this. This is guidance, right? Guidance is everything when it comes to monetary policy. Like, take the Fed and Fed funds, right? Like the level of the Fed, like, where the Fed funds rate is, it's in and of itself, or ECB policy rates or whatever they are, the, that level itself doesn't really matter. Like, what matters is where they are relative to market expectations and what's being priced in. The expectation management is the name of the game, right? That's the job. It's not the mechanical setting of appropriate policy rates. And that last point on uh, this use of the press and media t to guide uh, policy, you know, utilized not just by BOJ but other major central banks... See the weekend before this most recent June FOMC when the Fed via the Wall Street Journal had effectively conducted an unofficial intermediate rate hike to price in 75 basis points of a hike versus the 50 basis points that was priced in and later de delivered. It's exactly what I'm talking about in that video. And that's a game that the BOJ plays. And so I suspect that that video, which is called How BOJ Uses the Media to Test Policies, that video would also be of uh, probably even greater interest now more than ever. So 
If you haven't seen either uh, either one of those videos, please do so. The links will be in the description to this video. In fact, I strongly suggest that you watch those first, if you haven't yet, in order to just get a basic understanding of what BOJ has been doing, um, or if you need like a sort of a one-on-one -on -one overview of uh, BOJ's policy activity, which is n unlike any other major central bank in the world, things like yield curve control, um, how BOJ conducts fixed rate operations, offering to buy unlimited JGBs to cap yields, um, and you know the effect that all this has on global asset classes. Um, you know, so if you need a, a primer on BOJ, watch those videos because I'm just gonna assume people who are watching this one are long familiar with those sort of basics um, already and just are, are looking for an update. Okay, so back to AKB48 in JGBs. So in 2011, Japan was slammed by a massive earthquake as well as a massive tsunami. And that preceded, or some could even say that set the stage for something like Abenomics and BOJ Governor Kuroda to take the helm in 2013. But before Kuroda came, came in to uh, BOJ, okay, Japan needed to re rebuild infrastructure immediately. And so they had to sell JGBs or reconstruction bonds in order to raise funds to re rebuild. And at that time, the Ministry of Finance had actually called upon AKB48 to help market and sell JGBs to the public. Like, yes, that happened, seriously. And that in itself says a lot regarding the Japanese government's perceived state of financial affairs uh, and their concern in their um, ability or inability to sell JGBs uh, at the time prior to embarking on Kurodonomics. It's, it's almost like a last ditch effort to get, you know, these uh, let's say individuals to fund the government spending, you know, or, or tapping into any pot potential investors cash base, right, before they go all out with central bank debt monetization. This would literally be like the U.S. Treasury Secretary getting like the Backstreet Boys or whoever to auction off like treasury notes. Uh, in fact, the Japanese government had used a similar like JGB marketing and sales tactic a decade prior to before AKB 48. So in 2002, the Japanese government used uh, this extremely famous iconic Japanese model uh, named Norika Fujiwara to sell JGBs. Um, and they also reduced the minimum investment size of JGBs from uh, 50,000 yen to 10,000 yen. Or, you know, like $500 to like $100 minimum, right? Which is really no different from a company doing like a 5 to 1 stock split to get retail investors to, to buy the stock. Uh, and they did all this because credit rating agencies were downgrading JGBs to AA-, minus, which really pissed off Japanese officials because while AA- minus is still investment grade and still, you know, it's little chance of default, JGBs not only had a lower credit, credit rating than sovereigns like Greece, Italy, Portugal, Botswana, but JGBs were also actually rated lower than Japanese corporates within Japan. And I'm not just talking about the likes of like Toyota, but even like, you know, like small regional Japanese banks. So at that time in 2002, Japan's debt to GDP was at 140%. And compare that to counterparties at the time, like US was at 60% or just under, and then Italy was, you know, just over 100%. Um, so SMP, the credit rating agency at the time, saw Japan debt to GDP at 200% of GDP later in the decade, if left unchecked. That's what they were saying at the time. Japan's debt to GDP is currently uh, around 250% right now. Moody's in 2002 said, Japan's general government indebtedness, however measured, will approach levels unprecedented in the post-war era in the developed world, and Japan will be entering uncharted territory. That's what Moody said in 2002. Now, as pissed off as Japanese officials were at the time, in 2002, with these downgrades, there were officials within Japan who were also very concerned. Now, here's an important thing to note. The government's worry at the time 
was that JDBs might not be an attractive investment, not necessarily because of investors' like perceived credit risk of default, but rather because JGB yields were too low and therefore unattractive. Now, one could say that's sort of one and the same, regardless of what the, you know, the, the nominal yield is. If investors feel that the amount of compensation for the risk of lending isn't enough, you know, it's the same thing, right? But it really was more so that JGBs like offered nothing in relative risk adjusted returns. JGBs were deemed safe by the public. They still are for the most part. So I just want to remind everyone of this background context in which all of this current heavy handed market manipulating activity that's going on with like the JGB market and all that, all of that stuff that the Bank of Japan is doing, um, which BOJ had embarked upon under Governor Kuroda nearly a decade ago, that's currently still in place. We have to keep all that in mind, okay? And all, all this is just fairly recent history, you know, of, of a far less insolvent era in Japan. But that was nonetheless an era that was seen as unprecedented indebtedness, and it commanded the shilling of JGBs to the public using celebrities. Um, and here we are two decades later, Japan's debt to GDP is twice what it was, but... And here's the big but. Not only has Japan not defaulted, but JGB yields have only since then fallen. Or according to market rates, Japan is apparently more credit worthy today than it was 10 and 20 years ago. And according to market rates, Japan is far more credit worthy, credit worthy than the risk-free government of the United States Treasury is. And that is why shorting JGBs is called the Widowmaker trade. Because Japan sovereign debt defies economic gravity. I'm not saying that it can and will forever. In fact, I haven't even said anything forward-looking so far. I'm merely talking about what's already taken place and what we need to keep in mind, okay? So, those girls of AKB48, they weren't just like JGB salespeople, if you will. But one could even go so far as to call them accomplices in widow making. And for those of you who don't know the term widow maker, that's market slang for traders who have tried to short the JGB market specifically and have gotten destroyed in the process of doing so because JGBs defy gravity. Uh, and in the first half of 2022, we saw the widow maker trade make a major comeback, especially in June where foreign investors sold a record amount of JGBs and BOJ bought a record amount of JGBs. We also saw like daily trading volumes on JGB futures at the highest level since 2013 when Abenomics started. This is truly unprecedented month to end an unprecedented uh, first half of the year. Now, prior to this year, from the time of when yield curve control started in September of 2016, the Bank of Japan had announced a total of six fixed rate ops, two in 2017, four in 2018. And just to remind you, fixed rate ops are just BOJ offering to buy unlimited JGBs at a specific level. But that doesn't mean that the BOJ is actually able to buy. Um, it doesn't mean that the Bank of Japan and investors will actually conduct a transaction. It's, it's a limit order, right? So if the market doesn't trade there, you're not going to get filled. So of those six fixed rate ops that were announced um, from the start of yield curve control in 2016 till up until December of last year, of those six, we saw actual transactions where markets, you know, they take up BOJ on its offer and they sell JGBs to the BOJ. On only two of those six announcements from September 2016 until 2022, for a total combined amount of about 2.4 trillion notional combined in all fixed rate ops. 2.4 trillion. In 2022, BOJ announced 15 fixed rate ops from February until the end of April, eight of which resulted in actual transactions of selling JGBs to the BOJ for a combined amount of 3.5 trillion from February to April 22. 3.5 trillion as opposed to the 2.4 trillion notional of all of the combined fixed rate ops since inception. Uh, then, on April 20th, and remember that day, okay? Make, make sure that you have it like kind of burned in your memory. April 20th was a day that will live in infamy, as that was the actual official end of 
market floating 10-year JGB rates. As the BOJ started announcing consecutive days of fixed rate ups uh, going forward from there. Rather than doing so on a day-to-day -day basis as markets dictate um, the need to, to cap yields. And then, you know, those consecutive fixed rate ups led right into the end of the month where at the April BOJ policy meeting, BOJ announces daily fixed rate ops essentially forever. Um, which really is no change in policy because the BOJ was already always going to be there, you know, daily if necessary forever to conduct fixed rate ops when 10-year JGB yields hit the upper bound. But this put it in official writing. And so what it did was it had a, a fundamental impact on the investor psychology by removing that day-to-day, -day, you know, will they or won't they sort of uncertainty. But that date, April 20th, 2022, that last day of non-explicit fixed rate ops forever, this is a profound day for global cross-asset market impact, namely the Chinese Yuan. Okay, so keep this in mind. I'll go over it later. So then we go to May and June of this year. The Widowmaker trade started piling on, right? Shorting JGBs, mostly by foreigners. They're betting that the June BOJ meeting, um, the Bank of Japan would have to widen out the 25 basis point upper band of yield curve control at the June policy meeting. And at the June policy meeting, BOJ did not change anything and stuck to its policy. 25 basis points is the cap for yield curve control on the upper band. And widows were made that day. Um, but the week of BOJ's policy meeting was absolutely insane. Okay, um, it's not just in terms of JGB volatility. I'm talking about global cross-asset volatility from the start of the week when basically 10-year JGB yields slipped out of the hands of the BOJ and traded as high as 30 basis points despite this so-called unlimited floor of buying at 25 basis points on JGB 10s. And when all was said and done, BOJ purchased JGBs worth 16 trillion yen, or about $125 billion, in June alone. It's the largest monthly total that they've ever done. It surpasses the 11 trillion uh, that they did in November of 2002. Uh, yes, going back to the days of Norika Fujiwara being the face of JGB buying, not BOJ Governor Kuroda. So, I just want to put out all of that in context, okay? Now, I want to take a look at cross-asset uh, markets, like, year-to-date through a series of charts, okay? But first, let me just start off with a very basic on yields and currencies, namely dollar-yen. So... One of the main fundamental drivers of currencies um, and their price action is uh, yield spreads in between different countries, yield differentials, okay? So remember, currencies are pair trades. You can't just buy just the dollar or just the British pound standalone, right? You're selling another currency against it. Like, you know, if you're long USD JPY, you're buying USD and you're selling JPY. Or if you're short, you know, AUD USD, you're selling Aussie dollars and buying US dollars and so on. So that long short is often a function of yield spreads. You sell the lower yielding currency to buy the relatively higher uh, yielding one, or you borrow or fund with the lower yielding currency to buy the higher yielding one to capture the yield differential. So this chart is the yield spread between 10-year US Treasuries and 10-year JGBs. Okay, it's very simple. Now, as we know, due to BOJ's yield curve control, 10-year JGBs are pinned down at around zero by policy. So it doesn't really matter like at what specific level JGBs are pinned down at. All that matters is just that it's pinned down, period, and that it's static. Because that means that if JGB yields are static, then the U.S. to Japan nominal yield spread, that movement will be dependent on whatever it is that the U.S. yield is doing. Um, as you can see here, when I add this 10-year U.S. yield uh, chart on top, okay, they're essentially the same exact chart. And if currency pairs can sometimes, you know, reflect or often reflect this yield spread differential, 
then dollar yen would reflect the US to Japan yield spread as I overlay chart of dollar yen on the same chart. And indeed, it does overlap uh, or overlay quite nicely. And so that's why in large part, this is why dollar yen and the 10 year US Treasury yield mirror one another. Not all the time, not to the same degree all the time, of course, yes, 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 all that. And yes, there's various other factors at play, things like FX hedging costs, Japanese buyers for U.S. Treasuries that eat away at the nominal yield spread and premium and all that. But I'm just giving a very basic one-on-one on the dollar yen and the U.S. Uh, yield relationship as I get that question often and often with like very overcomplicated in their explanations and all that. So that's the very sort of straightforward thing, okay? Um, and it's important to know how that works. Okay, so with that said, let's take a look year to date. Okay, year to date, this is the 10-year JGB yield. And by the way, ignore the huge spread spikes uh, at the end there, they aren't really accurate of where JGB yields were during JGB cash trading hours. And I have an entire explanation about this on a Twitter thread that I wrote from June 17th. So please take a look at that. I have an entire explanation for that, especially if you're using TradingView, but even if you're not, um, just note that whatever it is that you're using um, to see what the current you know, generic yield is on 10 year JGBs or any anything for that matter, but especially on JGBs. Um, just make sure that you're kind of using different sources to cross reference. Don't just go off of one. Um, but as you can see, 10 year JGB yield started the year at around 0%. In fact, a month prior, and so in December 2021, 10 year JGBs were not only hovering around zero, but many days they traded in negative territory, which was certainly not an uncommon thing for 10 year JGB yields to do so in the last several years. Okay, here's the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield uh, overlaid in red. And you can see that Treasuries also start the year off far lower than they currently are. Um, they start the year off like below 1.5%. Now, these are both on separate axes, like in this chart. So it's hard to visualize what the yield spread between the U.S. and Japan is. So don't worry about that for now. Just note the direction. Right, the price action uh, action direction. JGB Treasury and Treasury yields, by and large, move directionally in tandem. They both rise and fall together for the most part. Right, and this applies to um, DM yields globally, not just for U.S. Treasuries and, and JGBs. Now, this yellow line is BOJ's yield curve control upper bound ceiling of 25 basis points, and obviously, this only pertains to the yellow JGB yield chart. It has nothing to do with the U.S. part. And as I just mentioned about how DM yields move directionally in tandem with one another, notice how in the beginning of the year, both US and JGB yields started rising sharply together in a massive global bond sell-off. Okay, but then in mid-February, US yields suddenly topped out and started declining sharply. Why? Was inflation solved in mid-February? Did the Fed get suddenly super dovish? And no, this was not um, Russia invading Ukraine either, though that obviously did have a temporary bid in bonds. But as you can see, Russia is not at peace with Ukraine and Treasury yields are much higher. And the timing also are is, is off from that peak point. Now, so what happened was JGBs hit the yield curve control upper bound. BOJ therefore announced a fixed rate up to buy an unlimited amount of JGB 10s to cap yields at 25 basis points. And mind you, this was the first fixed rate up announcement BOJ made since 2018. Okay, so it's been a while since they've done this. And when they did so, JGB yields topped and declined, as did US yields. And by the way, no JGBs were actually transacted at, with that fixed rate up, that particular one in February. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I had been saying in my BOJ videos from before this time period that BOJ yield curve control has been a major influential part of keeping global financial markets like in order or as they had been, you know, for the last several years. Um, as keeping a lid on JGB yields sends Japan's domestic capital trillions overseas in order to get yields and thereby capping DM yields abroad and thereby keeping a low rate environment which thereby helps push risk assets ever higher. And therefore, the reversal of that or the uncapping of JGB yields would be disastrous for all risk assets. It would be bad for bonds as bond yields spike, and it would be bad for risk assets as bond yields spike. 
JGBs are not immune to a global bond sell-off, and JGB yields also rise. We, we then see JGB yields get capped by BOJ's yield curve control at 25 basis points, but this time it doesn't cap global yields. When global yields are rising and JGB yields are artificially capped, then the yield spread between JGBs and treasuries um, and other global yields widens. And as that yield spread widens, so goes the respective currency pairs. So when I add a chart of dollar yen on top, this is why dollar yen has skyrocketed by, you know, 13, 14%. Uh, to 20 some odd year highs in a matter of weeks. And the yen be, being the worst performing currency against the dollar um, by far, just with the exception of the basket case Turkish lira year to date. So shorting the yen or long dollar yen is the global macro trade in 2022 um, and an extremely crowded one at that. But it's a, it's, it's a, it's a Fed trade. Okay, because normally rates traders would bet on something like, you know, uh, where where the Fed funds rate is going to be, or where they're going, where they they anticipate they're going to be priced to be. But there's so much uncertainty right now with Fed policy, and front end rate implied volatility is also through the roof. So people just don't know what the hell the Fed will do, and for good reason, given that June FOMC weekend 75 basis point press test, right? So instead of the traditional bet on Fed or ECB or RBA or whatever hiking policy and to what level and to what amount, the bet is now on policy divergence versus BOJ, or a, like a long short ARB on hawkish central banks against doves, or a dove among the major central banks. And so therefore, short the yen. That's why the yen is getting destroyed. That's why there's so much focus on the yen. That's why the yen is an extremely crowded trade. That's why there's a lot of risk in a potential short squeeze in the yen. And I'll get to that as well later. But now let's just take a look at BOJ's fixed rate JGB buying activity overlaid on top of all this. Okay. So before April 20th, Fixed rate ops were conducted as needed. And those purple circles are BOJ's fixed rate op announcements as yields on JGB 10s hit this upper bound. But then on April 20th, a day that will live in infamy, that's when things changed. That's when the that was the end of the markets not knowing ahead of time whether BOJ will announce a fixed rate op or not, as marked with this purple line. And then after that, um, you go right into the end of April. BOJ announces fixed rate ops on every single business day going forward. No more announcing day to day. Then in June, the week of June FOMC and BOJ and Bank of England and all that and SNB also like sneak hiking rates and all that kind of stuff. But that week, JGB 10s actually yielded up to 30 basis points, which means that they traded at a market rate below the unlimited buying floor. And the JGB short selling piled in, betting that BOJ will have to widen out yield curve control band to accommodate this like rising global yield environment. Um, and with Japan inflation finally hitting the 2% target and, and so on and so forth. The Bank of Japan did not do that and widows were made. Now, I am not a fan, as in I absolutely hate like market sayings, things like, you know, don't fight the Fed. And my my favorite, as in my most hated one, is when people say the most dangerous thing you could say in markets is this time is different. No, the most dangerous thing you could say in markets is that very sentence. Because every time, every moment that passes is by definition unprecedented and different. And there's never, ever some sort of Groundhog Day repeat. Every market setup is different and all of that. I get the general concept, yes, yes, like bubbles can will blow up and what I, I get that, right? But things are always different. Um, however, that said, I'm going to use two of those sayings uh, hypocritically myself. This don't fight the Fed thing. So turns out that that was sort of nonsense because markets basically fought the Fed through the 
first like six percent of transitory CPI, um, and fighting the Fed was the correct move when the Fed was incorrect. And the same goes for nearly every other central bank globally. Again, hypocritically, Japan, like almost all matters economically, is different. And you don't fight the BOJ, at least history shows that those who do, by shorting JGBs, have left an ever-growing graveyard of tombstones and crying widows. So, I will give my view towards the end, my personal view um, towards the end, but generally, my view is that yes i do believe that there is a good possibility not a high probability but a significant probability exists for boj to uh, widen out the yield curve control band um, and if it happens it would not at all shock me however do i think that it's worth actually putting on a short position on jgbs to into a boj meeting like as crowded as trade as it is personally no I don't see the risk reward uh, in doing that. I see clearly that the Bank of Japan uh, is staunchly going to defend 25 basis points. And furthermore, I believe that the more that foreigners are shorting JGB futures, and in, in other words, the more that like there are, people are trying to fight the Bank of Japan, the more staunchly the BOJ is not going to move. Actions speak louder than words, and as far as we can see in actions, the yen can go to hell because it's about supporting the JGB rate market, not the foreign exchange market. That's why I brought up AKB48. That's why I brought up 2002 of trying to market JGBs um, and getting pissed off at credit rating agencies and all of that from back then. Okay, Because a falling yen is terrible for Japan. It is felt every day by everybody on the ground here in Japan, Japan imports, um, you know, basic raw materials and energy is in need of energy, just like everybody else is around the world. It's really kind of in a, almost like a Europe situation, you know, not, not as bad, but still pretty bad. Japanese like corporate giants do not really get as much impact, uh, beneficial impact from a weaker currency as it used to, given a lot of the offshoring that it's done. As you can see that there's a clear decoupling between dollar yen and Nikkei for many years now. That's not a that's not a thing anymore. If you still think that is, it's not. Um, and clearly, what you're seeing is, as I demonstrated in, in those series of charts before, the Bank of Japan or Japanese officials in general, they can only do one of two things. They either support the JGB market at the expense of the yen, or vice versa. But you can't do both because of that yield spread and a wide in a in a surging yield environment okay time matters in the sense that not like necessarily a calendar year per se maybe a japan fiscal year which is uh, starts and ends in um, end of march but i'm more so talking about or thinking about it in the sense of bank of japan governor kuroda's historically long term ending in april of 2023 that's the timeline in which in the lens in which i'm looking at okay so if I'm talking about time, that's what I mean. Like, how much time is left until, you know, this guy is, is gone? Because when he when he basically leaves, whoever his successor will be, and it really doesn't matter too much on these upper house elections that are, you know, imminently upon us in Japan. It doesn't really matter so much about that because it, it'll, whoever it is, like, there's no Japanese Paul Volcker or something like that coming in. Um, but there will have to be in my view, some sort of policy shift. It doesn't matter what it is, but because if they don't, if they don't and they just continue to adopt Kuroda's policies, then they are trapped in Kuroda's policies right from the beginning, right? That's your one chance to hit the reset button without looking like everything the BOJ has done up until now has been a complete like massive waste and blowing up of the central bank balance sheet and destroying the JGB market was for nothing. Like, that's the only way you do that. You have a new person, you Kuroda bows out. He he accomplished the 2% target by the time he got out, right? Thank you, Kuroda, for your services. Now I'll pass on the baton for this next era is how they'll frame it, right? But that's going to have to happen. Otherwise, if they do one meeting, if meeting number one with new person, 
is an unchanged policy, then it's going to forever be unchanged. Or they're going to have a horrendously volatile time in trying to manage any sort of change. And markets will start to price things with every BOJ meeting going forward. But there is a major, major calendar date to be marked. I don't know what the date is exactly yet, but Kuroda's term ending in April 2023. And obviously that day in and of itself isn't going to be the day. It will be months prior to with everything getting priced in before that. By the way, BOJ meetings for that matter, I mentioned this before in, in the Real Vision da Daily Briefing. When you have a central bank who is in the, directly in the markets every single day and changing policy intraday trading almost on like uh, you know at any moment then every day is a boj monetary policy meeting day not just the actual policy meeting days in and of themselves now japan's jgb market the sovereign rate market these are internal matters right because boj owns half of outstanding issuance Japan's rate markets are the most internal among DM sovereigns, by far. This is not like the U.S. Treasury market, who is reliant upon foreigners, including Japan, largest foreign creditor to the United States, and China, U.S.'s economic adversary. That's what the U.S. Treasury market is dependent on. Japan is also not the European Union, with like a monolithic monetary policy blanketing, you know, dozens of splintering sovereigns. The JGB market, Bank of Japan, is not enslaved to foreign forces. Okay, BOJ has cornered half of the one quadrillion yen JGB market by blowing up its balance sheet far beyond any other major central bank. 120% of GDP to acquire half of the market and then setting the price on the other half. That sometimes even barely trades anymore. JGB market had been the second largest and most liquid sovereign debt market in the world. Second only to the United States Treasury market. Now JGBs trade like some super liquid microcap stock with a never-ending corporate share buyback program limited order for unlimited size set in place. Second largest and most liquid bond market, half nationalized and socialized in pricing. Simply put, destroyed at enormous cost to Japan. Or was it? Right? But either way, there's no turning back. Okay? The one benefit of doing all this is that JGBs are the only sovereign that is internally controlled. Like I just said, and I'm going to keep repeating that. And so why would Kuroda cede that one final but critical benefit of BOJ's radical policy experimentation because a hand, handful of you know foreign macro hedge funds think that they'll be uh, the historic profiteers of shorting JGBs and not become widowmakers? So another way to look at it, like this term widowmakers, and if you think about it, that's quite the title to have because it can apply to absolutely any trade on in any security in any direction, but... It's reserved for JGB shorts. BOJ and Kuroda are very much aware of that term and that title. And they need to maintain that perception because that's all they have left going for the BOJ. Especially in an era when don't fight the Fed turned out to be completely wrong. You were correct to fight the Fed. That is a nonsense saying. The term Widowmaker... That term is keeping Japan afloat. So Kuroda's message to markets and the world is simple. The people you are after are the people you depend on. Do not fuck with us. Now, I am making this no change to yield curve control bans in current market context. And if and when market conditions change, my views can and will as well. That's why I refuse to make any like steadfast call on this. And this isn't so much a BOJ policy call as it is a U.S. Treasury and DM yield call. If you think 10-year U.S. Treasury yields will be at 4% or 5% by year, and then yeah, you would probably also say that the ban on JGB 10s would also widen, and dollar yen would be at 150, 160 plus. But given all of the inputs that I have at the moment, JGB 10s are capped at 25 basis points in my view. I can also see a scenario in which they widen the bans, but not how one might think. Someone asked me on Twitter if BOJ widening the yield curve control bans would be seen as BOJ policy capitulation. My answer was, it depends on when, by how much, and how it's presented, and under what mar market conditions, okay? Take, like, right now at this moment. If BOJ widened the band now with all this foreign short JGBs and pressure, if they widened it by now, by any amount, then 
yes, that is capitulation. That is throwing in the towel. And hence, they will not do that for that exact reason. But if markets go from inflation concern to recession and global sovereign yields start to pull back and drop in the next few months and JGB 10s are trading at around zero as they were just half a year ago and then BOJ widened the band for the downside floor and presented it that way, then no, that's not capitulation, even though they've widened the band. And the, these are things that they can do. They're, you know, sneaky, I suppose. But you have to be kind of, you got to step outside the box a little bit and, and think of these different scenarios, right? Also, as I was talking about just now with like inflation to recession, right? There is nobody in the world who is praying and rooting on um, Jay Powell to strangle the United States economy into recession by ripping rates higher. Nobody is rooting more for that than Governor Kuroda at this point. Now, you might think that's a very weird thing to say, given that it's this policy divergence that's killing the yen and giving, you know, Kuroda a headache. But at this point, Kuroda would love to see a Fed that breaks things, that goes too far, puts inflation risk matters, turns them into recession matters, sees a bid in sovereign bond yields, and then you see JGB yields come down, and you see dollar yen come down, and Kuroda, who didn't move, and the markets and economic conditions moved towards him in a sort of uh, kind of quiet, I told you so, that's what he would love at this point. So he is he is rooting for 75 basis points, 100 basis points. Do intermediate 100 basis points. Just keep going and crash the, the economy. And then let's get another bid back into uh, sovereign rates and, and all that. So that's why for now, you're go he's going to say, yeah, FOMC is going to do what it's going to do and, and let them do it. Yeah, look, inflation looks pretty bad in the U.S. While at the same time, pretending to be concerned about the yen. The yen could fluctuate all it wants to. He doesn't care. And circumstances and context will determine the significance, not the widening or not widening in and of itself. However, regarding forward-looking policy potential changes that may occur. So with all of this focus on the BOJ's what yield curve control upper band, will or won't they move it? Something that people are com overlooking completely as a possible um, potential policy change is at the front end where monetary policy traditionally operates. In other words, that negative rate that everybody, including the BOJ themselves, hated five minutes after they announced it, begr but begrudgingly stuck with it since January 2016, that can move to zero or to minus five basis points from minus 10 current as a signal to satisfy the doing of something. I mean, after all, right? Like with ECB supposedly on a tightening mission and then the SNB sneakily shock hiking rates in June, which, by the way, that is the biggest actual central bank policy change that's not being talked about. And the market's now pricing in SNB to go another 50 in September, and the SNB is welcoming of a strong franc. If SNB hikes 50, as the markets are pricing, that takes SNB out of negative rate land. That leaves BOJ as the only major uh, central bank who is still on the upside down world of charging interest for the pleasure of depositing money with them. Negative rates in Japan were hated when ECB and SNB already had them. Imagine being the only major central bank in the world with negative rates. Now, if they remove negative rates, that would essentially be a pancake flat JGB curve as front end rates would be lifted to zero and 10 year JGB yields under YCC are supposed to be also be around zero. But again, can we really say that 10 base points is some major curve flattening or something? I'm not saying that that is um, that high a probability event, but I'm, I certainly think that that is much higher than the 0% probability or thought that's being put into it. Um, so again, these are just all just different combinations, different out-of-the-box ways of thinking about what they're going to do. What they will not do is what everybody wants or expects or is focused on them to do. They don't do what markets are pressuring them to do. The more markets pressure them to do something, the more they don't do it. They could move yield curve control to target, you know, other areas of the curve, given the fact that the 
Japanese yield curve is the most fucked up looking thing ever. You have this weird kink that comes down into the 10 year because that's where they're targeting all their buying. And then where you have seven year rates higher than the 10 year, then beyond 10 year, 30 year tenors like going way, way higher. 10s, 30s on JGBs are insane. They can move out to that end, right? And crowd out Japanese life insurance companies. So there's there's m many things that they could do b besides the, the yield curve control like shifting on the 10 year bend. The Bank of Japan can cap the yields at, like at 25 basis points if they want to. The reason that they moved up through 30 basis points during that week is really just a mechanical technical thing because they do their buying at 10, 10 a.m. And then if yields move higher that day and they don't conduct a fixed rate operation, then you could have prints going up there. And people might sell just because of the fact that they might believe that the Bank of Japan has lost control or whatever it is. You have an unlimited printing press. You have a current account surplus. You have a massive net international investment position. Japanese can print and buy as many JGBs as possible. Now that they own half of JGB issuance, and now that everybody knows, now that that's out there, what, then what's, what is there to lose anymore? The, like owning 60%, owning 70%, owning 80% of outstanding, not that I'm saying it's going to go there yet, but doing that, what's that going to do? Is it going to freak out markets? Is that going to cause a uh, shorting of JGBs? There aren't any more left to borrow because of the BOJ. Okay, and by the way, I'll get to the other uh, matter of them screwing futures traders who are shorting futures as they did with June expiry and targeting the cheapest to deliver issuance. I'll get to that in the next video because this one's running long. But again, these are just things that you need to consider and need to think about. It's not uh, getting uh, pressured by foreign hedge funds and so on and so forth. And if anything, there will be pressure from the general public, but they don't really even care care about that. So the changing of policy is a much lower probability event than I think that most people realize. But that does not mean by any means that it is off the table. Look, I could be totally wrong. Maybe the widow this time will be Mrs. Kuroda. Who knows? But I seriously doubt it. So I'm just putting things into context and giving my view. Okay? We'll see you for the next one. Thanks. <laughs> Would you consider cutting the, the negative? I'm just curious. Because this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep my JGBs out your fucking mouth. I'm going to, okay? <laughs> very difficult to ignore the markets, right? Ooh, th ooh. Anyway, the point is that uh, that the control mm. has been functioning quite well. Yeah.